Go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Find the perfect gift. And wow the people you love. Wow. Wow. This is amazing. Whether you want to say happy birthday. So cute. Or I love you. I love you too. Thinking of you. Wow. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Celebrate the people you love. Hi, I'm Jim McCann, founder of 1-800-Flowers. We created this podcast to share the wonderful people we get to interact with, we get to meet, we get to know, and most importantly, get to learn from. So I invite you to join us on this journey here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. It's a treat for me today to, to be with, uh, with three uh, wonderful guys and uh, to talk about a subject that's uh, near and dear to my heart, one that we've been writing about and chatting about quite a bit recently. And and I find that more in uh, social informal circles than in uh, in in written form or here in the podcast. And in all, let me confess right up front to uh, three terrific people here that this podcast is nothing more than an excuse for me to uh, have conversations I want to have with people I want to spend time with, people I know I can learn from and enjoy interacting with. So it's a uh, it's a big disguise, frankly. Uh, it looks like we're trying to do something beneficial here, and indeed we are, but it really is an excuse for me to spend time with people I like and respect and want to learn from and interact with. And uh, and to assemble the three of you here today is a real treat, a particular treat for me, because uh, I confess that you're all good friends of mine. And uh, over varying years, Larry, you and I uh, are longest tenured. I was just thinking about it this morning. It's over 35 years we've been friends. Know. Wow. And uh, you grew up uh, in Queens and in Nassau County, and I grew up in Queens, New York. And uh, and at one time, we had a store slash office telecenter about 200 yards from a place you grew up in Queens. Yeah. Yeah. And so our paths intersected, but we never met until it was in the 80s. Uh, I was commuting to Dallas. You were living in St. Louis, where you still live. And you pitched us on an idea, which I rejected. <laughs> Multiple at one eight hundred flowers, and it turned out to be one of the great promotions of all time, and it really, really started on us on the path of becoming a a national brand at one eight hundred flowers, and we'll 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 cover that more. But Larry's a uh, the longest tenured of my friends on the score, and he's a he's a really clever guy. He's a marketer extraordinaire. I think uh, I I would certify you uh, in in the McCann School of Certification as a linguist. Uh, you were so smart and knowledgeable about uh, people and marketing and brands and positioning. Uh, you teach at Washington University. You have a consulting firm called Zarin Consulting. You spent the uh, the biggest part of your career uh, at, in the earliest days of a company called Express Scripts. And I think over the, your tenure there, it grew to be a, was it would it have been a seventy billion dollar market cap company, Larry? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we'll touch on that, but. And I saw how you uh, positioned them not just as a benefit, uh, a pharmacy benefit company. You positioned them as a as a storyteller, as an owner of a, a a piece of intellectual space that differentiated from its competitors. And I think contributed greatly to the fact that you came from nowhere to be the dominant force in a in a new industry. And you and you and you helped shape what that industry was. Uh, next in tenure would be my friend Dick Orletta. Uh, Dick runs a company, a, a communications company called RC Oletta. Uh, we've been friends probably for 15 plus years, 15 20 years. It uh, Our friendship was birthed around sports and our mutual uh, uh, love of the New York Mets. And uh, we've become quite close and are lucky enough to be part of a group of friends that gets to spend time together. And Dick, you, you've worked on so many things and so many brands you've worked in the B2B space, you've uh, managed uh, companies and business personalities. Uh, so uh, uh, you're, you're, even though we're longtime friends, you're second in, in tenure here. And my newest friend, my COVID buddy, is Dr. George Everly, who is at the uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, also on the faculty of the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, a psychologist extraordinaire. And I got to know George at the very beginning of COVID because I confess that I wrote him a fan letter over an article he wrote in Psychology Today at the very beginning of COVID. And I thought it was brilliant. And I wrote George a letter complimenting him on the work he had done. 
And I said, geez, I hope we have a chance to talk someday. And he wrote back to me and said, well, I'd love to talk. Why don't we do that? And we did. And we've become uh, COVID buddies. And uh, we're doing lots of things together. I so respect you, George, and the work you do. And, and in particular, an article you wrote recently in Psychology Today about the subject we wanted to chat about today, which is what contributes to the difficulty of adult males and, the, and their friendships and relationships? And why is it difficult and becoming more difficult, apparently, for men to have and maintain uh, appropriate adult male relationships. So let me kick it off with you, George, my newest friend, uh, attended now three years, uh, and ask you, uh, give us a little insight into what caused you to want to write that article. And I look forward to the discussion with three close friends about why we have difficulty with male adult relationships. George? The idea, the seed, if you will, was... Uh... Uh, from a, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Douglas Strauss, who is um, a remarkably gregarious, outgoing kind of guy. He's founder of the CEO Club in Baltimore. Uh, but we've been friends over 60 years. And we, I think we have a unique friendship. And he, he uh, emailed me one day and he, he said, I've been thinking about this notion that uh, women seem to have far easier time connecting and seem to be just far more inclined to do that than males. And he said, what do you think? Is there, is there anything of interest here? And I'm, I'm an intellectually curious guy. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about quantum physics and male, male relationships and all kinds of just, I'm just curious. So I started doing a little research. <clears throat> I had kind of grown up I was a physiologist before I was a psychologist, and I, and I, I was a, more of a neuroscientist. And I was interested in how the brain worked, and, and there's considerable evidence that the male brain is structured different than the female brain. So one of the issues was maybe that's the answer. Maybe males are wired differently. Women are wired, females are wired to connect, males not so much. But interestingly enough, you would ex you would ex Expect that to be expressed epigenetically. So we, we would see that in society. And it turns out that this concept of friendship and, and male and ma male to male uh, interconnectedness and social support was actually talked about by Aristotle. And he talked about friends and three types of friends. Now, did you grow up with Aristotle, George? <laughs> I just look like I did. <laughs> I, I am a fan of Aristotle, I must say. And he said there were, there were three types of friendships. Uh, one was utilitarian. The other was for recreation, basically. And, and, and the last, uh, if we translate the Greek literally, it, it means a, a friendship of goodness. Uh, we've Anglicanized that into uh, friendships of virtue. So those three friendships... Uh, were what he kind of saw the whole horizon of, of relationships and uh, consisting of. But he was quick to add that utilitarian friendships, while powerful, can be short-lived. And he ultimately said they are not friendships at all. He said recreational friendships, friends, uh, friendships you just based on situation plus kind of hanging out, going to a ball game or something, whatever they did back in Greece, they were superficial at best. He said, really, the only real type of friendship is, is this virtuous friendship. And when we analyze what that is, it's the type of bond that says, I wish the best for my friend. I expect nothing in return, and I will be there when my friend needs me come heck or high water, uh, and again, ask nothing in return. So then we looked at history and said, well, well, has that played out in history? And believe it or not, it pretty much has. So this notion that there is this distinct biological difference that dictates females to be really, really good at connection and men not so much was really starting to be challenged. So with that in mind, you go back and you, you look further, you dig a little further in history and say, well, what happened? And it seems 
that there are two factors, Jim, that, that seem to create what we see today. One is the influence of culture. There are certainly cultures which embrace the notion, encourage the notion of male friendships, male networks, if you will. Uh, oftentimes they're in the Mediterranean regions. Uh, the second thing that seems to dictate this network or lack thereof is just opportunity. Uh, do we have the opportunity to bond? So if, if we take a look at relationships, the, the golden formula is proximity yep. times interest. And it seems that as we have moved through the 1800s into the 1900s, especially the mid-1900s, those things separated. There were less opportunities. And then, of course, we had in the 1930s, Gary Cooper and John Wayne, who set powerful role models. And when's the last time you saw Gary Cooper or John Wayne cry on somebody's shoulder? When did you see, when was the last time they just kind of hung out? Yeah. They really didn't. So I think there are well, a number that, of factors going on here. That begs the bigger question of what role in our cultures does, uh, what are the influences? And in, uh, when you were growing up with Aristotle, there weren't movies and TV shows. There was some literature, but not as much as there is today. But it's amazing the role that movies play. I mean, uh, in my lifetime, I remember hearing that JFK, President Kennedy, destroyed the hat industry. And he destroyed the hat industry because he was the first president who didn't wear a hat. Now, he didn't wear a hat because he had a big Irish head like me, and he had a lot of hair unlike me, and he didn't like wearing hats. He thought he didn't look good in them. But he destroyed the haberdashery industry. And who is it? Uh, it was a Clark Gable who in one movie took off a shirt, his shirt and he didn't have a, a T-shirt underneath and single-handedly uh, caused the sale of T-shirts to drop by 50% in the next 24 months. The role of, uh, of, of our role models in, uh, in the entertainment industry and in politics and, and in general culture, what impact that has on how we see ourselves and the role of relationships. Uh, Dick, uh, you've, you've uh, managed some big time personalities in your professional life. L let's accept that we all feel that it is a little bit more difficult for men to maintain relationships than it is for women. If, if that's the case, what do you think contributes, Dick? I think it's the way we're brought up. Uh, and my example would be my dad had a relationship with my mom that was absolutely unique in the depth of their love for each other. He loved his kids. He never kissed me or my brother. Never. Never, huh? Nope. Nope. Never said he loved me. Uh, his, his dad was a bastard, beat him with a barber's strap when growing up. And my father-in-law died when I was 30. And he used to kiss me when he left and say he loved me. And I decided I was going to do that with my father from that day forward. And for one year, every time I hugged him and kissed him, I felt him cringe because men didn't touch, whether it was physical or emotional. And that changed finally after a year. Uh, I was meeting him at a restaurant that the family went to in Coney Island, where I grew up. And he was in the back packed house. He saw me come up the stairs and he stood up with his arms spread. And from that day forward, he kissed me and hugged me every time I saw him and said he loved me every time he left me. And I told him, you never know when it's going to be the last time. Make sure it's the last thing you ever said to me. Mm -hmm. And you know, Dick, this ties into what Jim said around role models, because we don't have to look to the big screen for role models. Um, they're in our home. Uh, <laughs> and my father, same thing, never, ever told me, he loved me until he was on his dying bed. It just wow. wasn't just wasn't part of and I rarely end a conversation with my children ever where I don't say I, you know I love you. One of the obstacles, I want to go back to to Dr. Everly's. I read the article around enduring relationships and the five conditions, and I thought it was really interesting. And if I had to 
pinpoint maybe the fork in the road between with which women have greater ease into establishing stronger, more intimate relationships than men, it would come down to the point you made, Dr. Everly, about self-disclosure. I have never been with a male friend of mine or friends where one of us was brought to tears based on the topic of the conversation. I have never seen my wife speak with her friends where one of them was not brought to tears based on the topic of of the conversation. And around self-disclosure, and I'm just talking about my relationships with the men in my life who are truly friends. Forget about the concentric circles of acquaintances, which all of us via our businesses and, you know, just... I have hundreds of acquaintances just based on my personality, what I did for a living. And they matter too, right, Larry? We discovered that in, during COVID. It was even those micro contacts, the, the familiar barista, those matter too, but not like those real friendships. No question. As it relates to self-disclosure, I do believe someone has to lead on the dance floor. That one of the men has to take the stair step to conversation to something more intimate. For example, Jim, I may be talking to you and I'm struggling with, you know, a teenager at home. And I'll say, Jim, I have a question for you if you got a minute. You know, your kids are older now. They're in their late 20s. Obviously, you and Mary Lou went through the teenage years and I'm really struggling with something. And I was wondering if you had any insights. All of a sudden, from my experience, my relationship with that person just graduated. When I'm willing to initiate the self-disclosure. Larry, Jim alluded to a group that we belong to. It's called the Old Farts Club. It's eight guys who are contemporaries who have been fairly successful in business and life. And we go down to spring training at the New York Mets every year and drink wine and eat hot dogs and talk about life and usually have a, a dinner in the evening. And one year at the private dinner, one of the guys said, let's go around the table and talk about how we met our wives. It was really interesting, cute. The second year, somebody said, why don't we go around the table and talk about the influence our parents had on our lives? There was not one of the men in telling the story who didn't tear up. Yeah. The group teared up. And we all agreed that I'm, my wife, for instance, knew my parents pretty well, but nobody had ever asked us that question before. Yeah. And the intimacy, the third year, somebody raised the question of, is there something after we die? And the fourth, and subsequent to that, somebody said, I got one. What's the biggest regret of your life? And at the end of the conversation, we all concluded the connection was based on the fact that we stripped naked emotionally. Yep. yep. And, and, the, and Dick, the, and the, Sid, wine, the wine and the hot dogs would have not gotten you there. No. The, no. The, 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 the intensity. The wine might have. Which is a weird combo <laughs> to begin with, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> well, that's because we come from Brooklyn and Queens. But that's where most of the guys are from. Yeah, but most people would reference beer and hot dogs. You guys. <laughs> we, no, we're, we're winos. Yeah, you guys are the pinky out Met fans. You know. <laughs> There's two two points that are on the table now to your to your uh, work, George. One is Larry's suggestion that it takes one one person to lead on the dance floor to do that self disclosure to open the kimono and 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 be vulnerable. And then the second piece is what Dick taught uh, Dick talked about in an environment of trust, where there's already a relationship formed. That's when you're comfortable when someone takes the lead to 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 surrender to the atmosphere of of uh, openness and self disclosure and uh, and the group think there. So you have two really important elements 
to on that journey of deepening a relationship and making it beneficial to all. Is there a third, George? We've gone through and, and heard are wonderful examples. I would love to be a fly on the wall at those, at those dinners, by the way. Uh, they're not but, short, George. They, it's an endurance contest. <laughs> <laughs> with toilet <laughs> breaks. <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm not sure I could keep up with you all, but I'd love to try. <laughs> but anyway, I, I think what we've heard is exemplary of the notion of the two factors, really, which is opportunity proximity. You yep. created that. And sometimes you have to go out of your way to create it because society does not create it for us anymore the way it used to in the small village concept. And the small village concept even applies to growing up in New York, because although I never did, but what I've heard from you gentlemen and others is that it was a massively large city, but also broken down into little villages, which people very much identified with. Physical villages, a place, uh, Coney Island. And, and other villages, ethnic cross mixes. So, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, kissing your dad, Dick, and, and Larry talking about your relationship there, too. I had a similar uh, uh, intersection like you did, Dick. Uh, for a while, I always kissed my dad. And then I thought, oh, my God, I shouldn't be kissing my dad. And I grew up in a, grew up in a neighborhood that was a blue collar, ethnically diverse, a lot, a big mix of Italian, Jewish, Irish, Poles. But the, the ethnic dominance were Italians and Jews. And you talked about the Mediterranean influence, uh, George, in, in your, your comments about uh, 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 cultural differences. And uh, it's my experience that Italian Jews do a lot more kissing, men, men kissing other men, than, than Irish who kiss nobody. <laughs> so it was a time in my life where I, I thought, well, I, I'm a teenager now. I shouldn't be kissing my dad. And yet I had a bunch of Italian friends and uh, and they're kissing one another when you see them as a normal thing. Now, COVID comes along and we all stop kissing one another. The only people I kiss now are old men that I know <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we're not afraid of COVID. <laughs> but it's uh, and then I then I like you, Dick, I, I started kissing my dad again because he said to me one time I was in my 20s now and he said, you know, I, uh, you stopped kissing me. It was like a decade and a half later. He said, one day you stopped kissing me. And I, I always, I was always hurt by that. I said, my God, dad, why didn't you tell me? I, I wasn't meant to hurt you. I was just ethnically confused. And, uh, and I was so glad he finally told me it, but I wish he hadn't waited 15 or 20 years. And I started kissing him again that day and kissed him every day till the, till the end of his life. And I made it a point with my sons to tell them that story so they're not surprised about the fact that when I see them, whether it's in a crowd or a home or in the office, anywhere, I'm going to go. When I see them, I'm going to go hug and kiss them. My wife's from Western Pennsylvania. I don't see men kissing men there at all. <laughs> I, now, you I, live in the Midwest, Larry. How the hell do they cope with you? <laughs> I've been doing some studying around what we call kitchen table issues. And certainly a term that's been used in the political spectrum for, you know, a few decades. But it's interesting, and this is a direct answer to your question, um, you know, things that bring people together for intimate times. And Dick just mentioned all of these great questions of being shared with others around a dinner table. Hmm. You know, the table has been on a real micro level, a place to convene and share personal situations, personal feelings, personal emotions, which leads me to a question from one panelist to another, to Dr. Everly, and that is, George Whit, what do you think about the effect on friendships Forget about work and productivity and profitability. And what do you think the effect of friendships in this new popular virtual workplace culture versus all of us convening under the same roof every day? We now are the most connected group of human beings the planet has ever seen. And yet we are the most interpersonally 
estranged. Why is that? This is not just George's conjecture. So the American Psychological Association routinely does surveys on the health of the nation and especially the youth and different generations. And as we take a look at Generation Z, those born 1996 and after, those most connected electronically, uh, we find that they are the most alienated, the most disconnected emotionally, the most anxious, the most depressed. And somewhere in excess of 20% of them said they had no close friends. Hmm. I, I would like to come back to something, though, because, Jim, you had asked me about the factors, and 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 proximity is, is critical. Uh, but apparently, Larry, the electronic proximity, which we think brings us close, apparently doesn't do the job, which I think is important. On its own. Yeah, exactly. But then I think, let, let's go back to something that, that we've been skirting around a little bit, and I, I'll just take the risk of providing a little bit of a scientific framework for it. We learn based on what we see. That both of you, Dick and Larry, called it role models. I called it culture. Uh, but at the more micro level, it is a role model. And what we clearly know is that human beings learn from what they see, high credible people doing rather than what they are told to do. And I'm a little embarrassed talking to three august leaders of industry. But you, you know that commercials are not as powerful a behavior change tool as simply watching someone in the movie or the TV show do something you want them to do. I think it's called product placement. Is the, uh, product know, placement. Right? And then what yeah, you're so, talking about is observational learning, which I've been, I mean, that is, yeah. Please. That's it. And that's the work going back 60 years to stand yeah. university. So by, by simply doing it without telling people, far more powerful. We put our heart into everything we do. We are farmers, bakers, florists, and makers who grow and create with a passion made with love at every step of the way because at the end of the day we know you're sending more than a gift 1-800-Flowers share with love one of my greatest regrets is the last time I saw my father not saying I love you so my father had fallen he was in a nothing life threatening he was in a rehab facility um, getting some physical rehabilitation and I was a little rushed and I was visiting and I was trying to arrange his discharge several days later. And I was kind of rushing out the door and I, I literally paused and said, I should give my dad a hug and tell him I love him. And for reasons unbeknownst to me, I, I didn't. And that was the last time I ever saw it. The angst, the, the, it, I, I think of my dad every single day of my life. Mm -hmm. I loved him dearly. My dad was a finance guy. Uh, he wasn't the huggy, I love you type. My dad showed he loved me. So sometimes the words are not necessary, but the actions are. So he showed me he loved me over the course of my life. And this last opportunity, I didn't know, of course, it was my last opportunity. Taught me a powerful lesson. You know, take nothing for granted. And don't hesitate telling people you love them. All of the gentlemen on this call, except myself, apparently learned that lesson well. I had to learn it in a diff difficult way. I think, the, I think your tense is wrong. I think we're learning. Yeah. As you look at the literature in your article in Psychology Today, tick, ticked off a uh, uh, little research on my part, George, to look into the summit. Uh, I've I've spoken to each of you and to our community several times about an article I read in December of 2018 in the Wall Street Journal about boomers, us, uh, the loneliest generation. And it talked about the contributing factors. Uh, we were the first generation in any large number to get divorced to move away from where we grew up, 
So the, back to your point about proximity, George. Uh, we're the first uh, generation to live longer. Remember when Social Security was introduced by Roosevelt in the 30s, uh, they set the retirement age at 65. Life expectancy at the time was 62. It's now 82. Uh, think things have changed. So we're we're living longer, and we're not good financial planners. So we're living past our income. We got divorced in large numbers as a, as a generation for the first time, moved away from work, moved away from where we grew up, was sometimes then, as a result of those divorces, estranged from family, estranged from children. Oh, and we also decided to embrace bad uh, eating habits, so we embraced uh, diabetes in large numbers. So we were in bad health, outliving our savings, uh, estranged, lonely, and not living where we are, so uh, ergo the loneliest generation, but not to be outdone. It seems like millennials and Generation Z and X are all trying to compete for that loneliest generation. So now uh, on, in surveys that are done, uh, I, I saw in another piece in the New York Times, it said the headline was American men appear to be stuck in a friendship recession. And since 1990, as you pointed out, George, we have the same number, 20% of all men, five times more than in 1990, say they have no friends at all. I find that astonishing, dangerous, and sad. And uh, and I, I, I see it now in, in those other contributing factors. The Surveys, uh, Survey Center on American Life uh, came to some similar conclusions. Uh, young people are marrying later. Uh, they're, uh, they're geographically mobile. So they don't, they, Oh, let's move to St. Louis. Let's move to New York. Let's move someplace away from the center of the family. We all grew up with multi-generations of family around us. Uh, that's less and less the case. I think that contributes. And I see it in my kids and I have three kids. I think they're all really good parents. Uh, my youngest married at 30. Uh, uh, so they all started later than I did, 22. <laughs> uh, so they had children later, and now they spend more than twice as much time with their kids than my generation did, which I think is good, but it has a consequence in terms of that that formula you talked about, George, proximity and interest. If you're spending more than twice as much time with your kids, which is laudable, there's less time for you to be investing in adult relationships, adult friendships. So I think there's big macro tectonic kinds of plates that are influencing it. But the bottom line is uh, uh, two, out of 2,000 adults surveyed in 2021, more than half of all of our populations and almost 60% of men are dissatisfied with the, the number and breadth and depth of the relationship, friendship relationships they have in their life. And that seems to me to be a crisis. And as you pointed out, uh, the three of you pointed out, uh, this digital capability doesn't seem to be helping that much. And that's, that's kind of surprising to me. The influence of social media is potentially disastrous on forming meaningful relationships. Even the words that are chosen, uh, I'm not on some of, I'm not on virtually any of these things, but I know there's one that says, you know, friend me. It's a verb. Uh, so, and and people people almost emotionally live or die by how many friends they've gained in a day or lost in a day or a month or whatever. But those are not friends. Words matter. So, it, it, if these disconnected acquaintances are interpreted as friends, there's no motivation to really come together and cultivate even what Aristotle would say is that virtuous friendship. Yeah. Your group, the group that you have, is amazing in that you come together and you ask, and, and Dick, you know, wonderful examples of those, those questions where, to borrow Jim's phrase, open the kimono. Um, I had a, a, a colleague who was much older. He was very successful in the health club industry. He was a tough, tough guy, started uh, by opening a gym, a boxing gym, literally in downtown Baltimore, tough area, moved it to fitness centers, hired Cher and Arnold Schwarzenegger to be spokespersons for him, ultimately developed the probably the largest health club chain in the in the world. 
And I remember he was high school graduate, a tough guy, but we went to his house for dinner one night and he would invite people that he just found interesting, I guess. Consonant with the example you gave, the, the question, that wonderful probing question. And he, we just went around the room. And his, I, the one I remember the most was, how do you want to die? Hmm. And it, it took people back. And it was interesting what people would say. And I was, my mind was spinning, listening to people from all, there were politicians there, successful business people. And, and I didn't know what to say. I, I was thinking, but well, I should come up with something quite eloquent. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I was struggling. And I was just listening to people. And finally, he said, George, and it blurted out. And I said, I want to die helping somebody else. It just came out. Didn't plan it. And it's probably not coincidence that I went into a helping field. But those types of probing questions not only help those, it helps us. That's the key. And the, the, the key is listening because people don't listen. They ask you, how are you doing? And if, on occasion, if you say, no, I'm not too good. I just found out that I have cancer. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I went to the dentist yesterday. You know, I, I tried mentoring young people for years. And 20 years later, I'm still talking to them. But I'm asking them questions about what's their, did the nine-year-old child get away to sleep away camp? Now I cheat. I put it in my computer. But I, I care. You know, I have two friends who are top-notch attorneys whose wives have Alzheimer's. I talk to them every couple of weeks. And they say to me, they don't talk to anybody about it because after asking how you're doing, they talk about the baseball game. Well, that brings up a, a, a couple of points, Dick. One is, uh, it goes to Larry's point, someone has to lead on the dance floor, uh, asking the questions. And, and, and true confessions, George, about the group that Dick and I are privileged to be a part of. The reason why it's a very intimate community, and we only get together a couple of times a year, uh, is because of Dick and our, and our fearless leader, Fred, because they are such good, warm, and comfortable in their own skin people, they set the tone. And the group is disparate, uh, but all different kinds of walks of life. We have the most successful uh, divorce lawyer in the state of California. We have a famous uh, 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 magazine writer, uh, all different fields. But everyone, everyone in that group feels comfortable because Fred and Dick, who created the, the group accidentally and now not so accidentally, are the, those kinds of people that you described, Larry, willing to take the first step, willing to show their vulnerability and their interest and ask the questions. And not only do they ask the questions, but to Dick's point, they really want to know the answer. Jim, so it I, takes someone making the investment. I want to add to what Dick said and what you just said with a different challenge or dilemma. <clears throat> If you look at our concentric circles in our lives of really close friends, well, obviously, in addition to family, really close friends, good friends, acquaintances, people I know, you know, this really, really reinforces, you know, what, what Dick said. I have a situation right now unfolding where I have a very, very close friend who is moving from really close friend to okay friend. And the reason is exactly what Dick said. I ask him every time we go, how are the kids? How's your new grandchild? You know, what's going on with blah, 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 blah. And then I listen. He's never asked me a question. He's we never, call those people interesting, but not interested. Yeah, he's never asked me a question. And I mean, I will really probe about 
the health and well-being of this person, that person. And he answers, he's never asked me a question. So now that it's a pattern, which is not we just all one, know those people. <laughs> you know, I'm moving that person out of my bucket of really good friends. Because when it comes to the, you know, the virtuous friend, like George was saying, you know, I don't even know what to do with this person, but it's unfolding. And I hope they don't listen to this podcast because um, they'll know who they are. Um, but it's well, maybe, really maybe it would be good if they did listen. Yeah, I thought about that. What they learn. You know, they, I have said this to this person three or four times. I say, you know what bugs me? Joe, his name is not Joe. I said, you don't ask me any questions about my kids. You're right. You're right. You're right. But he's wired not to do it. He's hard. There's a hard wiring. And he's wired not to do it. Larry, I, I have said for years, friends are the family you choose for yourself. Because we all have family members who are that way, who are self-absorbed. I get rid of them at a certain point. That's my point. Uh, I, 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 I can't make the emotional investment. There's too many other people that I can in, invest in emotionally who give me, a, a, as George said earlier, something back that is so deep, that is such a gift to be able to communicate on that level with human beings. My, my wife died nine months ago. My, my grandkids right. know the I love you, et cetera. I'm with my 13-year-old grandson. We're having dinner, and he starts talking about my wife and her sickness. And he says to me as we're walking, you know, I put, the last thing that he said to me was, I love you. I mean, what's that worth? I, it's, that's what it's all about. And, and when I talk to young people, I, that's what I try to tell them. Yeah, the um, the research now around happiness, you know, one of the key drivers, which I've always been a big proponent of, and this is a challenging question to maybe you guys or to, to friends of mine, is, um, you know, one of the key things to happiness is meeting strangers and converting them to friends. And quite frankly, not just like-minded people. You obviously... Your interest in the Mets brings you guys together in a so an affiliation through a house of worship, brings people together. Um, our kids' little league teams bring kids together. But one of my hobbies is meeting strangers. And I mean that literally. Like, I really enjoy it. I have, you know, ha happily married. But when I'm out of town by myself, I love to go and sit at a bar and have dinner because I look forward to striking up conversations with the people to the left, to the right of me, and the bartender. And then once in a while, in this hobby of meeting strangers, and this is interesting, there's ever been research on this, George, once in a while I identify a person, and I say to myself, I'd like to become closer friends with that person. Like late in life, you know, mid-60s. Early said, I'd like to get to know that person better. In some instances, I've told that person that. Like, you and I should get together again. Like, like this is an interesting chemistry. But it's not necessarily based on like-mindedness, whether it be political, whether it be sports. It just somehow we engage in a conversation that, that, that's deep my curiosity. And I think that that key around happiness, that happiness means having people in your intimate circle that don't necessarily believe in all the things you believe in. I think that's rare and getting more rare. But I think that's extremely rare. As I've gotten older, the only thing that matters is relationships. George, you talked about proximity. A conversation I've had with each, uh, with all of my kids is just making them aware of the impact of social 
contact and their friendships and relationships at different life stages. So uh, uh, you have friends from school, high school, college, whatever it is. Uh, then you sometimes then you get married, uh, and then you you move sometimes far away, sometimes just a, a next door community, uh, and then there's a little valley beach, uh, where your network starts to narrow because you merge two different social worlds, you and your spouse, your partner, and uh, there's a natural narrowing of your community of friends. Then you start to have children, and now your relationships start to migrate to being people you meet of like circumstance whose kids are in your kid's class and and your new community. So your network narrows. Then as you get to be like we've all gone through empty nesters, then it changes again. Uh, Now uh, career and influence has your network. And then when you get to be a broken down old guy like me, married to a young woman like my wife, uh, we're very conscious of the fact now, and Dick, you and I have had this conversation we have to be deliberate and aware of the fact that your circle begins to narrow again. Death, disability, geography. So we all, uh, being in the New York area, we have lots of friends who spend a lot of time in Florida. Some of them now are moving there year-round. All of a sudden, you do a little inventory and you say, wow, that close group of friends of nine or ten or so couples or people, uh, it's narrower now because of geography. They decided to make Florida full-time or they travel more in the wintertime. And you ha- I'm finding in my life stage, we have to be deliberate about managing our network and, and being open to having new people. Some people, the, their circle just narrows and narrows until it's really small. Uh, what are you guys seeing in, in your social worlds? There is something that narrows our lane and, and, and fights against the, the trend you're talking about. It is called the confirmatory bias. We are wired to seek out people that are like-minded. We want to confirm our predilections about the world, our our predispositions, our attitudes inadvertently. What it does is it shuts us down for the possibility of growth. So by introducing diverse points of view, you don't have to agree with them. But let's assume the other person has a remarkably disparate point of view from yours. You know, they're they're educated, they're intelligent. How in the world could they possibly have that point of view? To me, that's a curiosity. I want to know why. Teach me. Whereas, unfortunately, especially what you see today sociologically, we are seeking that confirmatory bias by only looking at news channels that confirm our pre- our preconceived notions or only watching commercials that already have trying to sell us what we already bought. And at some point is the journey of life ultimately about growth or is it confirming where you started out? Because if it's the latter, it's not a journey, it's stagnation. And what I know as a neuroscientist, if you don't stimulate the brain to grow, it actually reverses it's it dies is is that the role that sports plays for a lot of people it's a a reason to connect it's a reason to have common interest it's a safe safe ground for connectivity it's i think it's a safe ground that allows you to connect without connecting emotionally you know the the great game yesterday how'd alonzo do uh and you get into that conversation, but hey, how's your wife feeling today? I know she went to see the doctor last week and you were worried. That doesn't occur. The thing that intrigues me, by the way, I noticed this last night when I was watching uh, some sporting events. I don't remember growing up when a team won a game, uh, players hugging the way they do now. And I the thought in anticipation of this conversation to me on a simple level uh, is look at the example that these athletes are, are giving, the, the genuine hugging that goes on between them. Yeah, yeah. Is that a trend? It didn't happen years ago, but that's comparable to what I say with the new baseball rules. Joe DiMaggio didn't hug Yogi Berra? 
No, but he also didn't scratch his crotch between every pitch either. Right. <laughs> but they, it, it is the new male greeting. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's almost the handshake leads to an embrace with yep. all all the men I know. And I think the question, Jim, about sports ties back to George's, you know, sharing Ar- Aristotle's thinking when they were having, you know, when they were at the gladiator um, uh, meets together, but. That would be bucket number two around recreational. I heard a great interview the other day with Ed Sheeran, the singer-songwriter, and he was talking about his his relationships with his friends versus his wives. And he was saying, you know, all of mine in the, are in the recreational bucket. He didn't use that term, but we get together, we drink beer, we talk about soccer, and my wife and her friends sit around and cry. You know, um, so... That framework is held up for a couple of years. I, I think he's a remarkably refreshing personality in the media space. Uh, how candid he is about what kind of kid he was. Yeah. I, I, I find him to be unbelievably refreshing. I agree. I think one thing that I'm taking away from this conversation, in which I would be preaching otherwise, but it's nice to hear the confirmatory bias part is that no matter where you start out, you can change. I said I was a a painfully, and I mean painfully shy kid. Um, And that changed. And it changed when I was 40 years old. And this this phrase came to me when my 10-year-old daughter was asking me to put on roller skates and skate with her. And and I said, no, uh, I was a full professor at a lofty university. We don't do that unless we do it perfectly. And okay. since I did not know how to skate, that wasn't going to happen today. And she was skating around having a good time. And then it dawned on me, this is one moment in my life journey that may never happen again. And the words came to me. I, d- I don't think it was an auditory hallucination, but the words came to me that Anything worth having is worth failing for. I put on the skates, went out on the the skate floor and had one of the best afternoons of my life until I broke my elbow. But (laughs) but, it was worth it. it, Exactly. Exactly. That's that's fantastic. And I think that (laughs) even at my age, um, I continue to learn. And the message I want to send to anyone listening to this that may be younger than our collective ages uh, is that no matter what your age, it's it's never too late to change. So as I continue to recall that moment where I had that lost opportunity with my father, I never miss the opportunity to hug my children when they are here and my grandchildren when they are here. Uh, and interestingly enough, I've got two girls and a boy. Uh, they are they are receptive. Even this generation, this this highly disconnected <laughs> generation. So I think it matters the roles that we want to see in others. We must play ourselves. Do as I, uh, you know, as they say, don't do as I or do as I say. Don't do as I do. No, do as I do because that's the most powerful way of teaching. So. There's hope. I want to be friends with both you guys, and I'm not today. As Jim, I've known for a long time, but I, I, uh, I want to be friends with you guys. So there's there's evidence to anyone who's listening about lead on the dance floor. You're three people that I learn from every time we interact, and sometimes in between. And I heard uh, uh, lots of good things today, and you, you two just talked about a bunch of them. Uh, and and Dick teaches me every day by example. Someone someone's got to take the lead. Uh, we can still change. Proximity matters, so arrange proximity. Arrange the trip to the ball game, the round of golf, the cup of coffee. Uh, it takes someone to lead in terms of the dialogue, in terms of it, being open. It takes genuine caring and listening to invest in and develop relationships. And even if we're broken down and old, we can still learn and we can still change. So uh, I take delight in introducing uh, one friend to another and seeing them develop a relationship. And 
I'm quite sure that uh, that uh, will be the outgrowth and product of our dialogue today. I think there's an intersection of new friendships around this uh, virtual table. So thank you. Thank you uh, for your contributions today, for this wonderful dialogue. And most importantly, thank you each for being a, a good and meaningful friend in my life. Well, I look forward to cultivating new friendships with Dick and Larry. And I want to thank you, Jim, for the opportunity to bring me in to uh, this August group and share some thoughts. And as do I look forward to developing the relationships. And Jim, you continue to be a good friend. Yeah, great closing remark. Yeah. Thank you. I really Thank enjoyed this. Thanks, Jim, for getting us together. Thanks, buddy. Birthday. Go to 100flowers.com. We have tons of great birthday gifts. Wow. Wow. Whoa. Happy birthday, baby. Happy birthday. Wow. Yummy. I got to contain myself. 1-800-Flowers. Celebrate the people you love. Well, I hope you enjoyed what you heard, and I know I'll be sharing it forward. I hope you get to as well. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow me along on Twitter at Jim1800Flowers and on LinkedIn at Jim McCann. Hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Celebrations Chatter. You can join our community by reaching out at chatter at celebrations.com. And while you're at it, tell us what topics you'd like us to explore here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to share it forward.